While my typical playstyle in Dark Souls is usually more melee-centric, there's something particularly interesting about the spell swap glitch. In speedruns, it's typically used to wrong warp to the kiln, but there's much more to it than that. Not only can it allow you to cast spells with different animations, it also allows you to cast spells with different equipment and requirements. So what if you wanted to use this glitch to do a miracle run, without leveling any faith? As with any run, the first big choice is what class to start with. Sadly, none of the starting classes have zero faith, so the next best choice is to pick the class with the lowest, Pyromancer. And with the choice of a master key as the starting gift, we're off to the Asylum. Once there, we're left with a bit of a problem. How do you beat Asylum Demon with miracles if you don't even have any to cast? Sadly, the answer is you don't, at least not yet. Immediately skirting some yet to be defined rules, we'll save and quit while defeating Asylum Demon during the first encounter so that he'll not only respawn, but we'll still get the big pilgrim's key from Oscar. Now we can exit the room while leaving Asylum for later when we actually have miracles to cast. Embracing the fact that this is not a glitchless run by definition, we pick up and dupe some starting souls in humanity as we make our way from the Asylum and into Firelink. With our newly acquired funds, we chat with Petrus a bit, making sure to buy anything that seems like it'll be helpful at some point, which is a bit given his stock of miracles. While not terribly useful yet, we can showcase our first spell swap. Conveniently with the pirate class, we also start immediately with a flame that we can use to cast our newly acquired force miracle. While we technically have the faith requirement to cast force, we don't have the requirement to use a talisman. Before we can get to some of the more fun applications of spell swap, we go through some of the standard early game route. Nulando Ruins for a Firekeeper Soul, Valley of the Drakes for a Soul of a Proud Knight. Skip RTSR for now, perform one of my new favorite glitches to upwarp an elevator to grab the Grass Crest Shield, fail trying to use Force to knock the Black Knight and Crystal Lizard off ledges, and finally make it up to Andre. Here we again dupe a bunch of stuff, finally getting some arrows for some larger dupes, and probably overprepare including upgrading all of our armor to plus three and leveling a bit much. Technically, we could stay soul level 1 as the pyro, but I'm anticipating that the run doesn't need any more challenge. From here, our next goal is to get a proper miracle to actually do some damage. Now, my first thought was the Warrior of Sunlight Covenant, as Lightning Spear is awarded right away, and it'd be easy enough to dupe Sunlight Medals for Great Lightning Spear. Sadly, however, just joining the Covenant requires 25 faith, which obviously goes against the point of this run. While you can lower this requirement, and even completely remove it by defeating bosses as a white phantom, co-op also feels a bit off for the run. Instead of embracing the sun, we can become a servant of Nido and collect Eyes of Death. With this, we can get both Gravelord Sword Dance and Gravelord Great Sword Dance. While these are the only two miracles that don't have a faith requirement, and thus can use Velka's Talisman to scale with Int instead, we won't be leveraging that much, if at all. Conveniently, there are a few Eyes of Death on the way to unlocking the Covenant but this introduces an interesting optimization if we want to dupe it right away. To do this, we'll start the dupe process at Andre and make our way to the Eye of Death. From here, we need to avoid doing anything that'll reset the glitch, such as save and quitting or opening a quantity prompt. On the way, we'll pick up another Firekeeper Soul, upgrade our Estus a couple of times, and enter the Catacombs. Skipping the majority of the area with a roll, it's then onwards to the Titanite Demon guarding both our Eyes of Death and the coffin that brings us to Nido. Now I'm not sure if the Titanite Demon can hit you while you're in the coffin, but the urge to save and quit was quite high. Thankfully I didn't decide to ruin the dupe star at 5 minutes prior, and hit around the corner to dupe the Eyes of Death before continuing on to the Tomb of Giants. Here we join the Covenant and rank it up to max to get our miracles, as well as 30% extra damage to both while we're a part of the Covenant. Now for the fun part, we get to try out our new toy, but in doing so I learned a few things. I'm as bad as I thought, or maybe worse, at the spell swap. The damage is currently pitiful, and you only get one random sword at a time instead of the typical AoE, making it exceptionally hard to hit anything. With things currently looking like a mistake, I think another upgrade is in order. First up is saving our fellow Pyromancer Laurentius, taking the completely intended route through Undead Burg with a jump, some ladder shenanigans, and a meme roll, we quickly make our way to the depths. Sort of. The issue is we're out of bounds, so our options are a bit limited. Trying the Soul Level 1 speedrun route, we talk to the invisible NPC and try to free him with the tools available to us. Unlike in the speedrun where they use firebombs, however, we aren't able to save him this way. So instead, we take a modified route that allows us to go back inbounds and save him normally. Sort of. With some ample soul duping, we can then buy his entire stock of pyromancies and upgrade our pyroflame. Unfortunately, the upgrade I was hoping for was a second pyroflame, which isn't how things work. Since we started as Pyro, he doesn't give us a flame, and we'll have to wait until after Blighttown to get a second one, so we continue onward. 
Back at New Londo Ruins, we pick up some sorceries and a catalyst, and while we're at it, we might as well start exploring Blighttown and finish upgrading our Pyroflame and get more Pyromancies. With that, we can try a new test to confirm. It's going to be hard to not accidentally hit things with a failed spell swap. I'm still terrible at spell swap. And we can now do a lot of damage when we hit. Our current set of upgrades is then finished up by saving Griggs and buying out his stock of goods, notably giving us even more casts of Solar Arrow for the many failed spell swaps I see in the future. And with that, we can make our way to the first boss of the run, Iron Golem. Yep, Iron Golem. Well, not entirely necessary, this does more quickly open up some future upgrades. Plus, who doesn't like Sunskip? With a parry, a janky camera, and a slightly uncooperative hollow, we eventually make our way back towards Andre and cross invisible terrain that we thankfully can still walk on and through an invisible gate that we thankfully can just walk through. On our way through the funhouse, we ask a friendly snake to break a wall for us so we can pick up a soul of a hero and save Big Hat Logan for later. After that, there's nothing too interesting and we just take a pretty typical path to get to the Iron Golem. All in all, the fight actually goes a bit better than expected. Sure, it's awkward to constantly try not to face the boss and accidentally hit him with a soul arrow. And it takes a few tries to actually get a successful spell swap. And Graveler Greatsword Dance doesn't even hit every time when it does cast. But the damage does look promising, and so does the one hit to stagger and one more to knock over. Sadly, we don't get the quick win by gravity, but we do get good chunks of damage. With some patience and one more good round of damage, the Iron Golem is sure to go down. And once he does, we're onward to Anorlando. For you guessed it, an upgrade or two to make sure the next challenge, Ornstein and Smo, goes as well as it can. First on our shopping list this time around is the Ring of the Sun's Firstborn. This will give an extra 20% damage to our miracles, and getting it isn't all that bad. The typical run through the rafters, and taking the giant staircase elevator down to the Dark Moon Tomb. Next, we continue the run through Anorlando until we get to the interior, where we can pick up our next set of upgrades, Havel's Armor. I'm not sure how much we'll need it yet, but with the amount of time spent casting and missing, I figure some poison defense could help, perhaps for LNS themselves, or at least for the four kings later in the run. It would be nice to have a miracle we can actually aim, so it's time to progress Onion Bro's quest line. Or, that's what I'd like to do, but he's not actually here yet. And even if he were here, he wouldn't hand over a mit force until after we had the Lord Vessel, so I'll spare you the time of an extra Sun's Gate skip or two I spent looking for what to do. While I'm in Firelink, however, I can at least pick up some more casts of Soul Arrow from Logan, in case spell swaps don't go my way. Now there's nothing but to continue onward to fight ONS with what we have. ONS is always an interesting fight to figure out, but this was something else. Thankfully, the bosses were kind enough to leave some space for a suboptimal start, swapping around some equipment. However, that's going to be about as smooth as things get, as the fight turns into quite the slog. A nearly 30 minute slog that's a bit hard to truly convey. Perhaps the best way is to skip ahead to some stats. So, in a 28 minute and 51 second fight, there were 76 times I failed the spell swap, getting an unable to cast animation. 66 times I failed the spell swap, wasting a soul arrow cast. 45 casts of Gravelord Greatsword Dance. One sip of Estus. And 32 uses of humanity. I really gobbled down the humanity like it was candy, which is the only reason this thankfully only took one attempt. While I'm very tempted to make a montage of getting bullied by ONS for an eternity, instead, let's go over the highlights of the times I was able to land an attack. Sadly, the first success was nearly three minutes in. While I don't typically target Smo first, I was going to take any hits I could get. It took about five more minutes to land another hit, really cementing the fact that Smo is going to be the first target. A third hit thankfully is the end of Smo, and we get to move on to Super Ornstein. It isn't until the next hit that I get to appreciate that Smo at least flinched, but as expected, it looks like Super Ornstein will take a bit more effort. And so, with a second, third, and fourth hit, Super Ornstein, and thus ONS, is done. In retrospect, I probably shouldn't have rushed ONS, but hey, it eventually worked. With that out of the way, we can collect the Lord Vessel and thus the ability to warp. Our first destination, oddly enough following ONS, is to make our way to Gargoyles. With an unusually smooth run past the sometimes troublesome night, and the usually troublesome hollows, we're all set for our next big fight. There's not nearly as much bullying going on here, but it's still a waiting game for skill and RNG to align. It takes a good two minutes, However, the reward is a one-shot, that means at least we won't have to deal with two gargoyles at the same time. It's not a terrible fight, but I'm really looking forward to having an attack I can actually aim. In the meantime, it takes two more minutes of running, dodging, and a bit of getting hit to do more damage and end the fight with gargoyles. After ringing the first bell of the run, we stop by Oswald to pick up a few more things. While we hopefully won't need it, this includes the intelligence space talisman, Felka's talisman. Back in Firelink, we visit Lawtrek and attempt to give him a forceful shove with spell swap. This, however, doesn't quite seem to work so well. 
Swapping back to Gravelord Greatsword Dance, it also appears we're just short of a one-shot, and so we need a second hit. Lawtrek manages some pretty good dodges and gets some hits of his own in, but eventually a Greatsword connects and we get the Ring of Favor and Protection. We don't equip the ring just yet, but rather head back down to Blight Town. Here we're met with an NPC invasion where we get to dance with Mildred. Like Lawtrek, she managed to get some interesting dodges in. She also does enough damage to need to heal, but all it takes is one greatsword for her to go down. All that's in the way of the next bell is getting through Quellag. Mirroring the usual melee strats, we stick close, circle, and attempt to dodge any explosion attacks. An additional challenge here though is that we don't want to hit with too many accidental soul arrows. This makes positioning particularly challenging, but at the end of the day, the damage isn't going to amount to enough to change the result of the fight. All the real damage is going to come from the greatswords. After running around, dodging lava pools, and hoping for attacks to land for six and a half minutes, Quelleg finally faces the music and we get to ring the second bell. Originally this was going to be an 80% run, using spell swap to wrong warp to the kiln. If that was the plan, the run would be just about over here, with just a fight against Gwyn left. While it'd be thematically nice to use spell swap wrong warp, it feels like there's so much more to mess around with. So as we run towards Ceaseless, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that this is turning into a longer run. Likely an all bosses run at this rate, with all the plans that are still left in store. Ceaseless isn't particularly interesting, just the standard run through the arena to bait the interaction near the fog wall, where you can take as long as you want to do the damage you need. As usual with this form of spell swap, this does take longer than normal, but it is at least more relaxed, not needing to dodge anything. Backtracking a bit, we can grab the second pyro flame that's available after defeating Quellag. First, we need to get infected with Egghead from an Egg Carrier. Changing things up a bit, we aggro an Egg Carrier with a somewhat proper cast of Gravelord Greatsword Dance, though note we don't have the stats for the Talisman, so it does nearly no damage, which is exactly what we want since we need to get grabbed and infected. Once we have a scratchy head, we just need to wait, and then we can talk to the former Pyromancer near the Daughter of Chaos to get another Pyromancer Flame. We'll leave this one unupgraded so that any accidental cast with it during Spell Swap won't do too much damage. Speaking of damage, we can finally make our way towards getting a mit force, a miracle we'll actually be able to aim. We do so by progressing Onion Bro's storyline, which has an interesting dilemma. While Ziegmeier tries to figure out what to do with the Silver Knights, we give it a shot as well. Going for some style points, we leverage Fire Whip during Spell Swap to get the intended behavior from Gravelord Greatsword Dance. The first attempt proves difficult as we only manage to get one Silver Knight and unfortunately aggro a Mimic. It almost still works out as we take out the Mimic and damage one more Knight, but unfortunately, we run out of AoE casts. A second attempt goes much better, with a single cast catching all three knights at once. Our first reward is the Tiny Beings Ring, that we'll probably not use. To get our true prize, we need to warp to Firelink and speak to Ziegmeier once again to get a Mit Force. And in case you're curious, no, you can't use the multi-hit nature of Fire Up during Spell Swap on a non-multi-hit miracle. No Mit Force machine gun for us. Next, we head back to the Undead Asylum, where the Asylum Demon has been very patiently waiting for us. He doesn't seem to like that we've been doing things out of order, and so promptly knocks us out the door, which is quite hilarious, actually. So instead, we get to dispatch two Black Knights, pick up the Peculiar Doll, and chat with Oscar one more time before making our way back to Asylum's arena. You may have noticed that we're still oddly using Gravelord Greatsword Dance at this point. Perhaps there's a bit of Stockholm's going on, but there's just something interesting about being able to use a multi-hit attack with Spell Swap. Since we're facing easy enemies, it should still one-shot, and we shouldn't run out of casts. While it does take a bit to actually get the hit off, Asylum Demon is indeed a one-shot, and we're off to our next demon. Here we will switch it up, and start using Emit Force. Stray Demon feels quite tanky, so we're going to want all the damage we can get. Although it does mean we accidentally get a few fireballs in, we also get one of my favorite animations of throwing force at enemies. Not my favorite is attempting to dodge all of Stray's explosions, and the aiming is still far from perfect. But if you've got good enough timing, you can even re-aim attacks and throw them the other way if you fail to get the spell swap. Thankfully, with a better tail end of the fight, we are able to wrap things up and get ourselves a Titanite slab for our troubles. At this point, we have plenty of options on where to go next, but we might as well use the doll that we just picked up. This will also let us acquire one of our next upgrades that will give us more, and faster, cast with Spell Swap. After thoroughly exploring parts of the painted world that weren't necessary, and spending way too much time with Bone Wheels, there it is. Fire Surge. The upgrade we were looking for. Here, we also run into another NPC invasion. While this does let us try out Fire Surge with Emit Force, the Painted World continues to not go as planned, and there's way too many other enemies around to make the fight seem worthwhile. So instead, next up is Priscilla. Again ignoring our recent upgrades, we use Graveler Greatsword Dance with Fire Whip. This time the AoE actually seems useful for when the boss goes invisible. We are still limited, however, on the number of AoEs as they quickly drain our Greatsword casts. 
while we'd still be able to spell swap, we'd only get one greatsword at a time, like in the beginning of the run. Even worse, messing up the spell swap and running out of fire whip casts will prevent any more spell swaps. Trying to avoid completely running out of casts like that, we thankfully get not only the tail cut, but shortly after, we also get the win against Priscilla. Following Priscilla, we have Moonlight Butterfly, against which we'll actually use our new setup of Fire Surge and Emit Force. There's not too much pressure here as the dodges are pretty easy and even getting hit by attacks doesn't really do too much. With the range attack we also don't have to wait for the usual landing cycle of Moonlight, and instead can just keep trying spell swaps until we get our attacks. With a few of those, Moonlight goes down and we're off to the next boss just through the Darkroot Garden. That next boss would of course be Sif. Since this is becoming an all bosses run, it has to be done. Sif loves to jump around, although even when she doesn't, Dark Souls loves to be Dark Souls, and so aiming proves to be a bit challenging. For better or worse, nothing else really interesting happens during the fight. A bunch of failed spell swaps, some emit forces that go wherever Dark Souls wants them to, and finally some that actually connect. Sif manages to get a few hits of her own in, but leaves ample room for healing, so eventually Sif is limping around and one last emit force ends the fight. The next plan was to make Anerlando Dark to fight Gwendolyn, but that ends up being a longer path than expected. First was the straightforward attempt to attack Guinevere, but that ends up coming a bit short. Instead of trying to solve that problem, there is another way to encounter Gwendolyn, but it means another trip to the catacombs. Here the goal becomes acquiring the Dark Moon Seance Ring, which is an easy enough pickup that just requires a bit of running around. While here though, we might as well pay a visit to Pinwheel, skipping most of the level with a bit more running and rolling, including past some mostly cooperative bone wheels, we're on to our next boss. Typically a fairly easy fight, this one actually poses a bit of a problem. With a few too many missed spell swaps, Pinwheel's clones become a bit overwhelming and take too many of the successful casts in place of the real boss. Thankfully it doesn't quite get to the point of losing, but restarting the fight leads to a much better result. While one clone still manages to play the hero, it only takes a few hits to eventually take Pinwheel down. Now that we're so close to the next upgrade, the detours continue as we make our way to Capra. Starting with a similar path to the one we took to Laurentius, we end up with another of my favorite glitches into Capra's fight. Entering the arena this way doesn't activate Capra's AI, but the dogs are still running about. Starting by taking them out, Capra becomes trivial and just requires standing still and managing a few more successful spell swaps. This now lets us progress Rhea's storyline. Down in the Tomb of Giants we can find Rhea and her two hollow bodyguards. After a bit of fighting in the dark, since we need both hands to spell swap, Rhea moves along to the Undead Parish. Here she has a bunch of miracles for sale, including our main goal, Wrath of the Gods. While using it requires almost being in melee distance, the miracle hits hard and doesn't really require any aiming. Just stand near an enemy, spell swap, and boom! With that very beneficial detour out of the way, the next stop is finally Gwendolyn. As with any fight against Gwendolyn, there is quite a bit of chasing after him to try and get brief moments of damage in. This isn't exactly great given that missing a spell swap often means no damage for an entire cycle. What seems to work best here is to bait out his arrow attacks and reach him during the second volley. This gives as much time as possible for attacks before he teleports, though his hitbox is still present a bit longer than that. While it takes a while to figure out this strategy, Gwendolyn isn't exactly threatening with his own attacks. Thankfully, we don't need to get to the end of this seemingly endless hallway, and Gwendolyn is finished after four Wrath of the Gods. Backtracking a bit, we can pick up yet another upgrade for our damage. Joining the Princess Guard Covenant rewards us with the Ring of the Sun Princess, which boosts Miracle Synergy by one level. Both Emit Force and Wrath of the Gods benefit from this mechanic, boosting damage around 5%. Next, we're off to the Depths. While we were here briefly earlier, it's now time to visit the area's boss, the Gaping Dragon. Testing Wrath of the Gods a bit more along the way, we encounter the Channeler who would annoyingly buff the boss, a giant rat that doesn't seem too happy about the axe in its eye, and the Knight of Thorns who's just annoying. Without the Channeler, the Gaping Dragon isn't too intimidating. Mostly the typical dodge, try to spell swap, and run around until he gets hit enough. The one mix-up here is that Gaping Dragon can destroy your equipment with his acid attack, and so he does. With a broken pyro flame, damage is severely reduced, but fortunately a repair powder fixes that right up. It's only a matter of a few more hits and Gaping Dragon is no more. Headed back to the Demon Ruins with Ceaseless already defeated brings us on our way to the Demon Fire Sage. But first, there's another invasion by Kirk. It doesn't seem like he wants to play this time and manages to find his own way out, and so we continue on to the boss fight. The first attempt, while eventually successful after 7 minutes, was a rather poor showing, with some of the worst attempts at spell swap yet. While it didn't happen, there was a significant chance that Fire Sage was going to go down due to Fire Surge, since oddly enough, he's not immune. Not satisfied with this attempt, we'll go ahead and give it another go. This is the first of only two successful fights redone during the run. The second time around, perhaps due to warming up and just playing better the next day, went much more smoothly. Nine Wrath of the Gods with minimal spell swap failures and no stray Fire Surge damage took less than a minute. A much better showing that I'm more than satisfied enough with to move on to our next boss who's a quick jog away. 
Centipede Demon with its arena full of lava is fittingly immune to fire damage. That means there's no worry of stray fire surges here, but hopefully it doesn't get to that point again. While it is tempting to glitch Centipede into the void, the fight eventually gets off to a pretty good pace, and Centipede drops the orange shard ring about a minute in. What I didn't remember, however, is that Centipede actually has projectile fireball attacks. After sending a few volleys of fire, Centipede then decides it's time to switch places. Even without the orange shard ring equipped, there's oddly no lava damage and the fight continues. One more Wrath of the God later, and Centipede allows us on to the next area. Before making it to everyone's favorite boss, it's time for a couple NPCs, a daughter of Chaos and our friend Kirk. After foolishly triggering both of them at the same time and playing a bit of tag, Kirk is the first target. A few Wrath of the Gods just barely miss, but Kirk is unable to make up for his last poor showing after a chase across a narrow route. The Pyromancer proves more capable with her Chaos Firestorms and ends up taking two hits before it's time to move on to the boss. Sadly, the NPC fights are still more interesting than the actual Bed of Chaos fight. Nothing about the fight really changes in this run. Just run straight to the first orb, roll into it, and save and quit. Run straight to the second orb, try to remember where the holes appear, hope you dodge wonky hitboxes, roll into the orb, and save and quit. Run straight to the chaos bug, try and remember where more holes appear, and thankfully get the spell swap first try. In an attempt to head to the DLC, next up is the archives. Here there are plenty of crystal soldiers we don't want to fight at the same time as the crystal golem. We clear them out individually as much as possible before finally taking down the golem for the broken pendant drop. Unfortunately, this is all a waste of time until you save Dusk, as only after she is rescued does the pendant drop, so that is where we're headed next. On the way, we clear out the halberd wielding Black Knight, the hollowed Havel in the Watchtower basement, and the seven headed Hydra in the Darkroot basin. This allows us to free Dusk after taking care of the Golden Golem, which understandably takes a few hits. While our main goal is just the broken pendant, we might as well summon Dusk to purchase the sorceries she has for sale. With that, we're back at the archives to clear the Crystal Soldiers and Golem yet again, but this time, we're rewarded with the broken pendant we were looking for. While we could just continue through the archives at this point, and it does hold the key to one of our best upgrades yet, we stay on course and head back to the Darkroot Basin, where we can actually pick up a different upgrade with the Crown of Dusk, and enter the short section before the Sanctuary Guardian. Even with the 20% damage boost to our miracles with the crown, the first attempt at Sanctuary Guardian goes pretty poorly, eventually running out of fire surge casts to perform the spell swap with. So tantalizingly close on that attempt, a few more casts would have been the difference, which would have actually been possible bringing in two sets of spells to swap with. Deciding against adding complexity to the fight, however, we go into the second attempt with the same exact setup. This is still going to be another long fight against one of the bosses I don't know particularly well. I remember a few things from old 80% routes, which helps find some of the openings to attempt to put damage in. Thankfully, unlike those routes, there's no real worry about getting one shot here. As usual, Sanctuary Guardian loves to move about, and the fight does feel pretty fast moving. There are, however, plenty of opportunities to heal and to attempt spell swap. The latter proves to be a bit difficult, but at least there are still plenty of fire search casts to go through. As we get to the 10 minute mark, Guardian is down to a similar amount of health as the first attempt, and we have 53 casts of fire search left. This hopefully gives plenty of attempts to land the one more Wrath of God necessary, which doesn't take too long. Next up is probably my favorite boss, but first we need to get through the Royal Wood. Typically this is a bit longer of a run where you get to meet Calamite, however with a meme roll we can take the shortcut elevator that's meant for later. With that shortcut out of the way, it's now time for Knight Artorius. While he can pose quite the challenge, his patterns can also be quite fun to figure out. Feeling fairly comfortable with his fight, some of my favorite openings include avoiding his leaping strike that doesn't have any tracking, rolling to the side of his charging lunge, and perhaps my favorite, rolling into his spinning strike that he starts with his greatsword on his shoulder. His somersaults, however, can be dangerous, as he can vary the amount he strings together. After three, you can usually fit in a hit, but with how long we're rooted in place with some of our animations, it didn't seem worth it at the time. While also slightly dangerous, and Artorius does take reduced damage during it, his buff followed by an AoE explosion is also an opening that can be taken advantage of. Proving most dangerous of all, as usual, is getting greedy. Elizabeth Mushrooms, which can be duped after picking one up in the Royal Wood, are nice for healing over time, but it can be quite disastrous getting caught in the middle of using one. Thankfully, we're not caught with a full somersault attack or anything, so we're shortly back up to full health again without being sent back to the bonfire. The fight continues on, dodging hits, waiting for openings, attempting spell swaps, and occasionally getting punished for a bit of greed. All in all, it's an engaging dance with Artorius that eventually comes to an end with one last miracle. Following that fight, we get the second, and last, meme roll of the DLC that opens up a shortcut that eventually leads to the Abyss. But instead of taking on the final boss of the DLC, it is instead time to set our sights on the upgrade promised earlier, which brings us back to the Duke's archives. Showing off another fun glitch, we can use a bow to set up Duke Skip. Admittedly, it's a stupid idea since we need to progress Big Hat Logan's storyline anyway, but we can at least pick up a few things on the way to the next bonfire. Deciding to move forward for now, which honestly is a risky move considering how convoluted NPC storylines are, 
we head through the Crystal Cave and encounter Seath the Scaleless. Thankfully, there's not too much strategy necessary for this fight. Standing near Seath dodges most of the attacks, and any that do hit are fairly easy to shrug off. Between our armor and humanity, getting cursed isn't much of an issue either. Using mushrooms even allows us to stand in crystals and outheal most damage. As usual, it's just a matter of time, and eventually we have yet another Lord Soul. Continuing the weird ordering of events, we head backwards toward the big jail cell in Duke's archive. While we don't get to meet Big Hat just yet, this does at least trigger events enough for his next encounter. There, we can progress things even further by buying all of the sorceries he has to offer. Now that all the conditions have been met, Logan has now gone insane in the location where he'd normally meet Seath for the first time. With a quick Wrath of the Gods, we now have perhaps the most interesting upgrade in a spell swap no faith miracle run, the Tin Crystallization Catalyst. Without getting too much into the math, this scales to the highest magic adjust stat in the game at 315. For reference, the fully upgraded Pyroglove we've been using so far has 230, and the Dark Moon Talisman you'd normally use scales up to 240. In more real world numbers, testing on some hollows around Firelink, we can see that we've been doing around 864 damage. With our new Catalyst and 60 int, we can do 1119 damage. Eking out a bit more, we can go overboard and level to 99 int for 1183 damage. The downside to this damage, however, is normally that you only get half the amount of casts. While we have run out of casts before, that's only one failing spell swap. A successful swap doesn't decrease the amount of casts we can do, so hopefully this won't matter much. Unless we go back for RTSR, which I hope we don't need, this is as high as our damage is going to get. Other than getting punished for picking up unnecessary shinies, all that's left is to start prioritizing the remaining bosses. First up on the list is the notorious DPS race, Four Kings. Back while exploring Anorlando, I actually thought we'd go with the tried and true strat of heavy armor like Havel's here, but turns out that's not really necessary. While the extra poise could be nice, upgraded armor is already proving to be a bit overkill as we're hardly taking any damage from the kings. Without consistent damage of our own, the kings do start to stack up, but they mostly play nice even if one does manage to get a grab off. Each king seems to be taking three Wrath of the Gods each. It doesn't look like we'll be getting the promised four kings, but rather three is going to suffice. Next up is another boss I don't have too much practice with, none other than Calamite himself. With some help from Goth, we do get to fight the mostly ground version of the Black Dragon, but that usually doesn't prevent the fight from still being difficult. Expecting a long fight this time, I decide on two sets of spell swaps even though it does make managing the cast a bit more difficult. Oddly enough though, the fight goes much better than expected with Calamite giving plenty of opportunities to try for spell swaps or to heal when his attacks hit instead. There's not too much to the fight other than sticking close, dodging fire breaths, and running away anytime he flies up into the air. Even his last attempt with the grab doesn't help him and he goes down with plenty of cast to spare, meaning that second set of spell swaps were completely unnecessary. There's only one more scary boss left, the Father of the Abyss, so let's pay him a visit. With confidence from such a good fight against Calamite, we're back to a single set of spell swaps. Even after getting hit by one of his most scary attacks, his Wombo Combo, Things are still looking promising as we have way too much defense with so much liquid humanity and upgraded armor. As if to prove this further, we have vitality to spare after greedily trying and failing to use humanity after tanking even more hits. While certainly scary, we just need to get the tempo back in our favor. Eventually, Mana starts incorporating his magic attacks. While the usual move is to use the Silver Pennant to repel them, this one can easily be dodged by running towards Manus. Instead, thinking this is one of his other moves, I opt to start running away and pay the price. Thankfully not a high one as the fight easily goes on. Not too long after, Manus is determined to show off more magic, with the first of which easily dodged to the side. The second doesn't go quite as well, but is again mostly dodged. Lastly, we get to show off the correct way to run from the first magic attack he used. With a couple more magic attacks dodged or tanked, we're able to get the last hits we need. This finishes up the DLC and just leaves a couple more bosses from the main game before finishing the entire run. First to clean up is the last of the Lord Soul bosses, Gravelord Nido. His covenant was integral to the start of the run, giving us access to the Gravelord sword dances, but it's now time to move on. The drop into his arena is always annoying, as are the various skeletons joining him. Starting by trying to take out the skeletons as Nido walks towards us feels a bit slow, so eventually we let Nido do some of the work for us. Careful not to venture too deep into the arena to aggro the larger skeletons, the strategy is mostly just to stick close to Nido and dodge as necessary. Distance is only really needed for his Dark Wave attack, which also takes out his skeletons. And one of the best showings yet with three successful spell swaps in a row, the last of the Lord Souls is now ours. In perhaps the oddest ordering yet, next on our list to ensure an all bosses run is Taurus Demon. While odd, it was a bit of a test to see how much damage we could stack up in this run. Unsurprisingly, the two Hollow Archers go down with one Wrath of the Gods, and so too does the Taurus Demon. At this point, we could take the normal way to Gwyn, but what kind of spell swap run wouldn't use a wrong warp? Sacrificing a few spell slots, we can take a swap for both Wrath of the Gods as well as for Homeward. 
As usual, it takes a few tries, but once we get a spell swap atop the railing in Undead Parish, we're off to the Kiln of the First Flame, and we make our way through the last area of the game. Easily making it to the Foggate before Gwyn, we're just three Wrath of the Gods away from the end. Opting to leverage the Lord of Cinder's weakness, the fight is a fairly quick and clean set of parries and spell swaps. Swapping between Shield and Pyroglove, and between the different sets of spell swaps, is a bit annoying, but more than manageable. Compared to the nearly half hour ONS took, a sub minute Gwyn helps demonstrate how capable a build this turned into. As drawn out as some of the fights have been, 10 and a quarter hours isn't too bad. Of course, leveraging the many glitches of the game helped, but for me, that's part of the charm of Dark Souls. It always leaves you wondering how else can I break the game?